This is a no surf music, Burning River Fireside Chat, with guest Eric Taylor. I'm your host, Jason D. Diesel Hammond. For the best in Americana, alt country, indie rock, and more, point your browser to nosurfmusic.com. <laughs> you told GS how to write songs. Or did not to write songs. Okay, but let's all put to some better glass his on. song writing skills. <laughs> To, to go back to Jill, Billy Joe Shaver, simplicity is the answer. Oh, I love What can we take out of that? I, 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 I'll, I'll tell you the best Billy Joe Shaver story if, if, if you'll ever I'm hear. I'm listening. Billy and I, and uh, uh, the guy that owned JMI Records at the time, or was working for JMI, they had a house right next door. Where JMI Records used to be was Pat Boone's Parsonage. Uh, Pat Boone's father's Parsonage. That's where they had the JMI Records. That was Cowboy Clinton. That, that was where the office was. Hmm. Well, Billy was right next door <laughs> with us. And he, we stayed up all night long. And, uh, and uh, um, uh, the sun was coming up. So... Uh, so Ray said, um, boy, it's nice and cool out here. I think I'm going to cut the grass on Sunday morning. And Billy was sitting out on the porch screen. The porch had been drinking all night. Something coming up. And Ray says, I think I'm going to cut the grass. So he gets out and cuts the grass and just pisses Billy off, no end. And uh, he goes next door, where he lives next door, and he gets in his truck and he just throws gravel all, and just throws, reverse, throws gravel all the way down the road. And it, so we stopped him. Well, Ray stopped him. He said, what's wrong, Billy? Where are you going? <laughs> and Billy said, because it was Sunday morning, <laughs> Billy said, I'm going to church to pray for your sin and ass. <laughs> and just took off, man. Just took off. Uh, I'm going to church to pray for your sin and that cutting grass on a Sunday morning. You don't do it. You just don't do it. My fan wife told me, he goes, Bill here always says, I've had a bit of Elmer Gantry in there. <laughs> Well, you know, we did a show together in Italy, and I, I think I told you this story before, but we did a show together in Italy, and it was a big festival. And so these women, these Italian women, got up with no shirts, and they were dancing. They were dancing with, with Billy, with Billy's song. This is when his son was playing with him. Uh, uh, and, uh, yeah, that was a great band. And, uh, mm -hmm. They were all dancing with no shirts on and stuff like that. So, the, of course, security came and tried to get them off. Billy stopped the song and said, Don't you touch those girls. <laughs> God loves you when you dance. <laughs> I love me a Billy. True yeah. story, man. I mean, mm. I was just kind of sitting there going, thinking, I'm a part of this. <laughs> I'm, I really am a part of this. No, don't you touch him. God loves you when you die. So you're I'm going to that. church to play for your sin and ads. You know. <laughs> but they weren't dancing on a Sunday. No, it wasn't Sunday. It was a Friday. Well, there you actually. go. If they'd been dancing on a Sunday, he uh, probably could have complained. Well, if they were working. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's uh, Billy's uh, life. Billy ain't complaining. It is. But it's Italy. Billy you you, you, you never know when anybody's <laughs> working in Italy because most everybody doesn't have doesn't work, really. <laughs> well, if, if you can get a job unless like that, the, that's the best job to have. In, unless you're in the fashion business <laughs> and live in Milan, then you work. <laughs> But everybody else in Italy just sort of takes naps, like Jay. <laughs> Jay works. I know he does, but Hard. he doesn't write about working. He writes no, about he right. He does write right. about naps a lot. He does write about. <laughs> I think I'm not satisfying him. And I his thank wife. him for that. He, he, he he I don't want to hear about the him. you know the balance of the. the well, he doesn't write about his work. He never right, write. Exactly. He never sent messages about work, really. Well, yeah, yeah, you did, you did. You sent me a message that said, I've got to give some kind of speech or some, or yeah, or some speech kind of talk or something. Uh, anyway, but most of your shit is... Funny. 
<laughs> it's yeah, very, shit. Very, <laughs> very funny shit. Like the dogs are the shit I gotta read to my wife. squirrels. So here's what Jay's That's got my to favorite. Yeah. That 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 will right. go in the top ten <laughs> of all the Jays. <laughs> The, well, the dogs are barking at squirrels, but they're doing it from the comfort of the inside of the air-conditioned house. It's true. It's true. I just thought, God damn it. It's hard to pick a favorite. I dig yeah. it. Yeah, there's so many. Even myself, who lives with him, and I can verify most. Well, I mean, well, sometimes he... Oh, mostly. You're the one that gives me the... I do. I'm the inspiration to a lot of these stories. Like... You take his fucking egg day? What'd you do for me? <laughs> you want fucking egg eggs? Day. Egg day. <laughs> egg day. Egg day is important. So my kids will it's call the, me really. egg day and they'll be the like, make Jay some eggs. eggs. Once a week or? Egg, egg day is like, in the top ten of my day. Is it Yeah, Tammy's worried about my cholesterol, so yeah. she says I can't have eggs once a week. Well, you know, but I mean, really. You know, I, I actually think you can have really, more, but I don't want to cook them more. If you read about cholesterol... Eggs do not. Uh, uh, oh, you can't go there. With well, and another <laughs> thing is, he can make fucking eggs every day sell. of the week. He's no, got two orders. I ain't going there. You can't go I was there. told it I does. can't go there. I ain't oh, going there. Oh, well, you there. go anywhere you want. It doesn't matter. Here's the thing. Uh, uh, here's the thing. Well, I just thought it was a great one. He's a great writer. writer. If Tammy makes the eggs for you, uh, 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 and they are made with love when so I do. So you can only have Tammy made eggs once a week. For you your cholesterol <laughs> issues. You can I just thought, I just thought it was a great I just thought it was a great vibe. It's just not an egg day. <laughs> well, that's after my daughters have called and said, will you make Jay some damn eggs? He's online because I'm not online. <laughs> We're tired of him whining and eating. Right, the egg day, the egg day. I just day thought it was a together. great vibe. Oh, well, you're, you're missing half. Yeah. But no, egg day and taco Today is not an egg, egg day. Egg day and taco night <laughs> came together. <laughs> I need to learn to simplify. Holy shit. Well, we're... Uh, I, just, I mean, here. you can always... Yeah, here we are. <laughs> do what you want to do, man. Yeah, interview <laughs> us. I'm, I'm just I'm, rolling with it. We're recording right now, but if you... Uh, <laughs> he's a ventriloquist. I'm on his lap. Well, whatever works. Dummy. Well, all right, so... For anybody out there on the internet who is wondering what the holy hell is going on right now... <laughs> Here in Strasbro in a suburb in a garage. Um... That is our host, Tammy, who just filled you in on exactly where we are. We are in Streetsboro. We are. Yeah, we are. Uh, we are in Streetsboro, Ohio, at the uh, Honky Tonk just House Concert location. Series. Yeah, something like that. Um, and uh, we are here with a gentleman who just played. Uh, this is a rare after show interview and has a brand new album out, which we'll talk about, and that is Mr. Eric Taylor. So, hey, let's say hey, hi, Eric. It's good to see you. Absolutely. Um, and for those of you who also have no idea who I am, I'm Jason D. Diesel Hammond, your host, and this is another edition of Burning River Fireside Chats. Um, so in addition to Eric, we have, uh, like I said, our hosts, uh, Tammy and Jay, and some of the, what's the uh, terminology you use for people who hang out here? Your band of misfits or something, Jay? Denison's or misfits or... My losers. best friends. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> All Jay's best friends are misfits, is what we're saying. Um, Present. Exactly. There we go. Um, so I guess, you know, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about um, Eric's uh, music and uh, what he does and his new album. Okay. But there's also a ton of great stories, as you may guess, and I want to hear them all. Okay. Um, so we were just talking a little bit about uh, Billy Joe Shaver. Uh-huh. And he's a favorite of ours, of course. And, yeah, well, why uh, wouldn't he be? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, he is amazing, right? Yeah, sure. And uh, he's, he's a not great. a very good shot, though. He's, 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 he's a hell of a friend, but he's not a very good shot. You know, he told me that was the luckiest thing that ever happened to him. Because <laughs> he'd never shot that gun before. That he and he just nicked the guy. He nicked him. Yeah, he just hit him in the only place you can hit a guy in the face without hurting him, really. Yeah. yeah. So maybe he is a good shot. There you go. Maybe he is. Well, you know, that's a different take on it, really. But in Texas, what we were calling him, it's a bad shot. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, one, of, one of the other uh, great stories that I uh, had to ask him about uh, when I talked with him was how he was in Texas, obviously, and decided uh -huh. to hitchhike out to L.A. and ended up in Nashville. Um, yep. I, my geography is not very good, but that doesn't seem to make much sense. 
Um, you actually have a somewhat similar story, but your geography actually does make sense. Yeah, it does. Um, because you were out in, uh, was, were you in D.C. or were you down in Atlanta at well, the time? Well, I, I, I left D.C. I, okay. I was born in Atlanta originally, but I was uh, living in D.C. when I ended up in Houston. Mm -hmm. But I'd been there before because I had relatives I, when I was a kid. So I had different people trying to raise me, you know. So, I mean, uh, my parents just didn't seem to have um, uh, the will or, or interest in it at all. But um, I, I was raised by a couple of sets of grandparents and, and, and uh, ended up in Texas. And, I came back to Texas later on when I was on my way to California. That's I think that's, that's what I was getting towards. Yeah, that's where you're going. Right? So you were sort of headed to the same place. Neither one of you made it there, but at least you were still going in the right direction, right? Right. Yeah, I left DC. Uh, I went to Georgetown briefly, mm -hmm. and uh, realized that I wasn't a Catholic. And, uh, um, it didn't work out really. Uh, so. I left, and there was somebody that was going to Houston, and uh, and then on to California. And my original purpose of the travels was to go to California, like everybody else wanted to go at that time, I suppose. Although it was all over. Mm -hmm. there. And what year was this, just so people this know? This was in 1969, I think. Okay. Probably. So it was all over in California by that time. But I people still were going. It's like the gold rush, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I got to Houston, and uh, the, um, uh, it, it was a very fertile town for writers and players. Uh, Towns Van Zandt lived there at that mm -hmm. time. Guy Charles Clark lived there at that time. Lightning Hopkins, Big Mama Thornton. Um, so, I mean, I could hear all, almost anybody on any night. And I wanted to, and I, I saw town. I saw Lightning Hopkins on a Friday night, in a place called the Family Hand, and then uh, on Saturday I saw a Towns Van Zandt, and that's when I said, I'm staying here. This might be a good place to stick around if you yeah, like well, music. I got right? a job washing dishes in the joint, mm -hmm. you know, and I play guitar. Mm -hmm. That was when you decided you wanted to actually get into the music business and you wanted to get an education and you decided to stay in Houston. Sure. And you mentioned a few of those guys, uh, like Towns and like Guy Clark, yeah. who were there at the time. Can you just give us an idea of, you know, in the late 60s, early 70s, what that scene was like with those folks out there? It's, uh, it was just incredibly fertile uh, from the standpoint of writers. I mean, if you look at... Uh, if you look at, at what the Houston writing scene was, if you look at the writers that came out of Houston, really, I mean, um, Guy Charles Clark moved there from Rockport. Uh, he moved to Houston because Mickey Newberry lived there. Okay. So that Mickey was sort of the star at the end of that. So there was Mickey Newberry and there was... Um, uh, a couple of other writers. Who's the guy with the uh, Kenny Rogers who lived mm -hmm. there as well? And played little clubs out on um, on uh, Piedmont in Montrose. But Guy Charles Clark moved there really because from Rockport down there, or from uh, because Mickey lived there. Mm -hmm. And then Towns moved there because. Got Charles Clark lived there, and I moved there because they all lived there. It's, it's, I mean, I stayed there because I could see these guys any night I wanted to. Mm -hmm. So it was, a, I mean, a, from the standpoint of a writing place, really, it was as a writer, and at that time I was sort of a young, arrogant little intellectual asshole, actually, if you want to put it that way. That, uh, you know, I didn't think that performing was very... Uh, I thought that was almost beneath me. I thought being a writer okay. was it. So, over the years, I've learned to enjoy performing. 
But I didn't then. I didn't. I did it only because I needed to get my songs out. Continue to answer your question. I mean, uh, the reason that I stayed there was because of the writers that were there. And so many writers came out of Houston. I mean, uh, Nancy, Nancy Griffith ended up moving uh, uh, to Houston from Austin. Uh, and uh, we had a relationship, and then you know there was also people, a younger group of people that came up after we did. People like Lyle Levitt, and, mm -hmm. uh, Robert King, and, and that kind of business. But I mean, uh, I remember Shaver, Billy Joe Shaver, playing at the Oak Horror. You know, I mean, it's a place that only held maybe 40, 40 people, maybe. You know. If you really packed them in. Right, right. Well, kind of like uh, Jay's place here. Yeah, yeah. Billy Joe's coming, we pack them in. But yeah. um, so, who would you say was most influential to you from that scene? Who taught you the most as a writer? Oh, from think? the scene. Yeah, from, yeah, from, from, from the, the Houston scene. From the Houston scene. Yes. Well, I was very lucky, I think, uh, to be a kid my age, to be able to play bass with Lightning Hopkins. So. Okay. Lightning probably was the guy that taught me about how to uh, 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 never play the song the same way twice, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I don't, as everybody will tell you. I'd never play the same. I'd never play the song the same way twice. And also, I mean, he taught me about storytelling and how to uh, make. Make stories out of songs, you know. Okay. Well, actually, that. But then Towns, of course. I mean, you can't be around somebody like Towns, Van Zandt. You just can't right. without being influenced mm -hmm. by. I mean, you can't be around Lightning Hopkins without being it. You know, I mean, it would be like if you if you were a boxing fan, it'd be something like that. You, you couldn't be around somebody like Muhammad Ali without. Without being picking influence. up some stuff, from, of course. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it's it, it's quite similar in some ways, I think. So you are listening to these guys, and yeah. they're imparting a little bit of wisdom bit by bit on you. Yeah. What was the best thing that you learned, for instance, from Towns? Like, can you even verbalize it, or is it just you know getting his style? In your head and yeah, working it from there. I can tell you what well, the best thing I learned from him was uh, wear a corduroy jacket and a paisley tie. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a good plan, I guess, right? Works no, for me. No, I, I mean, you're, you know, you're talking about Townsend Sand. I mean, uh, you're not going to be, you're not, it, it would be like not being able, it would be like not being influenced by Johnny Cash. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or not being influenced by any of the greats, really. But Guy Charles, for instance, Guy Charles Clark mm -hmm. influenced me to a degree because he he kept everything very close to his vest, really. I mean, uh, uh, but, you see, I thought, when I first met Guy Charles, I thought he had written, like, 20 or 25 songs already. But he hadn't, you know, he'd written like two or three. Okay. You know, he was doing covers. <laughs> and I thought, wow, man, he must be wealthy. He must be really rich because, like, James Taylor's doing the, the fire and rain, you know, <laughs> which I thought Guy wrote. One of them's rich, right? Yeah, right. Well, I didn't. I wasn't. I didn't have enough money to have a, a, a car with a radio in it. Okay. So uh, it was only through my girlfriends that I were able that I was able to discover other people. Okay. Okay. But he was a, it, I, just being around Guy Charles and so, and his wife uh, Susanna at the time was a very, uh, I mean, that in itself was just an influential thing because they were both, I mean, they were writers, they were painters. Uh, uh, both of them painted very well, wall paintings. And uh, actually, when I first met Guy, Charles Clark, he was working as a graphic artist for a, 
CBS at the television show in, in, in Houston. Oh, I didn't know that. And a fan of mine, a, a, a news guy, came down and, and introduced us. And then we ended up realizing that we lived on the same street. Mm. Yeah. Very cool. But I was a kid. I was just a kid then. You know. Well, you you were a kid, as you say, and you were just starting out at the time. But mm -hmm. uh, one of the people that you did discover... Um, as you mentioned, and ended up being a uh, collaborator with, was uh, Nancy Griffith. Yeah. And um, Well, we were married. So right, I mean, right. Well, I almost didn't have a choice. So. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> you mean I guess, you know, if you don't sing well, on my I, album and well, I don't it, sing it, on I, yours, we're I in trouble, it, right? It, it, I suppose it means... Uh, I suppose it means how you would take the word collaboration. Okay. <laughs> well, what, what, what was that like then? Tell us what... Uh... We didn't write together. Okay. No, I mean, there's one song that I co-wrote with Nancy, which was pretty much of an accident. It was like you know, we were living together, and she was working on a song, and um, I was walking through to go to a gig, actually, and she says, hey, hold it before you go. What do you think of this? And uh, I said, well, what do you mean, you know? And, and, and she says, where do you think I should go with this? And uh, it was a song that we wrote, that we ended up writing together called Ghosts in the Music. So, okay. Uh, and then the other collaboration that I've ever done is a, also a, was an accident, it was with Lyle. I, we wrote Fat Babies together. So, I mean... Um, That, you know, I've never been much of a co-writer with anybody. Those are the only two people I've ever co-written with. Okay. Well, you um, you did both sing back and forth on each other's albums mm -hmm. and stuff like that, though. Mm -hmm. um, especially early on in, in oh, both of your groups, right? Sure. Um, and even recently. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I've... I've se oh, sorry. I've seen uh, when you do... Uh, when you did your uh, live album a few oh, years ago. So yeah, the, one live, of the, folks the Red Check uh, Yes. Um, sorry, what was the title of that again? Live at the Red Shack. Okay, I didn't want to step on that. I think I did. Don't but step on it. Yes. Uh, well, it's a good one to check out for people who want to see what you really like. But in uh, in 1981, you came out with your first album, right? Which yeah. was... Uh, Shameless Love. Shameless Love, yes. Uh, I'm so bad with titles, I have to look at them. Um, but then it was a long time before you came out with another one, right? right? Yeah. So, which I didn't was... come out with another one until 1995. Right, that was your Eric Taylor self yeah. title. Um, so what uh, what was the reason for, for the delay there? Well, I, I suppose everybody pretty much knows it. And, uh, uh, and I, I don't have any problem talking about it. I, I was strung out. Mm -hmm. um, I was a junkie. Um, and I was successful at uh, music business, even at being a junkie. But I knew that if... I mean, I was... I had become so successful at that time that I had a European tour where I had a number two record there. And uh, I knew that if I went, I wouldn't make it back. So I, uh, I stopped shooting up in uh, 83. Okay. So I ended up uh, being kind of pulled back into the music business by Lyle and some other people in 95, actually. I went out, uh, me, Ricky Lee Jones, and a bunch of other people went out in California and uh, sang on Lyle's uh, I Love Everybody record. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it allowed me to meet some people, other people in the uh, publishing business that wanted to hire me. So okay. I, got, I got signed by Polygram after from that, with Lyle's help, I must say. Um, and it allowed me to kind of come back into the business, you know, you know, getting paid to write songs, allowed me to go out and lose money at gigs. So, um, yeah, that was a very, very kind and helpful thing that happened. Mm -hmm. And a very... Um, Enigmatic, actually, thing, uh, because uh, you know, I went out there to sing on a few songs, 
and in, in Lyle, uh, out of his graciousness, said, uh, hey, why don't we just set up a couple of mics and why don't you just shoot some songs, you know? I mean, and I think we shot like 18 songs that night. Uh, Julie Roberts was there. It was pretty cool. Okay. You know, it's when he and Julie were together. Right. But... And we, it wouldn't have been sh- quite as convenient if they'd been broken up and well, she was still hanging out in the studio, it right? It wouldn't have mattered, really. I, <laughs> okay. I found her to be a very, very nice woman, and, and she was very kind to me. So, I mean, And she always has been, and still is. Cool. So, uh, uh, but it was one of those things where I, I was ready to come back into the business. But Lyle... Um, Lyle was instrumental in getting me back into the business, really. When you were working on uh, getting cleaned up then, um, through that whole time period, was it something that you missed? Was it something that you were thinking about doing? Or was I it still just... wrote songs. Okay. No, I went back to school and became an LPC. I became a lots of professional counselor. And work with uh, junkies coming out of uh, Texas prison. So... Uh, I also uh, taught ethics uh, at the University of Houston to psychologists and, and uh, counselors. So, Interesting. So, yeah. So, I mean, it was 13 years of, of uh, well-spent time, I think. But right. I think but in many I ways, was, completely the opposite direction of sure. where you'd yeah. been going. I think I was ready to come back into the business. At the, and when Lyle allowed that... To happen, I thought it was uh, really cool. Cool. I mean, so without him, I don't think I would have gotten a polygram deal. Okay. I mean, he's the one that that said you need to really listen to this guy. This is a guy that was a really great influence on me, and and so forth. And, and it by his graciousness and and, and, uh, and his kind will, I got signed with Polygram. Uh, publishing, so I, it allowed me to come back into business. Like I said, I mean, otherwise I would have been, you know, doing nothing. Right. <laughs> well, doing nothing artistically, but like you said, you had a lot of other stuff going on. Yeah, but so. I, I had done that. I had when I finished that, I had finished it. Okay. When, uh, when the insurance industry fell out of the bottom of the of, of, of recovery, um, then I, I found myself in working in places that weren't ethical at all, and we're doing some really nasty shit. So I, I, I said, no way. So it was a good time for you to get back yeah. into music then. Okay. Um, so what I was saying. Um, before we came inside to Get stop getting eaten for those mosquitoes. Um, for those of you who may have heard a strain in my voice, that's what it was. I was getting bit about a billion times sitting outside talking. Um, but I was just saying, um, one of, I think, the most interesting descriptions I've ever heard of uh, a musician uh, was about you and uh, came from Nancy Griffith. Uh-huh. Um, and she said that you were the William Faulkner of songwriting. Uh-huh. And in some ways that is so appropriate because, you know, what you do, especially since I, I've just seen your live act, yeah. it really is a storytelling more than it is music in some ways. Well, it's, and it's all about... Yeah, it's not some guy standing up there playing in A minor and love songs. Mm-hmm. You know, it's stories about people and characters. That's my only interest in, in, in this business, really, is being able to write about the characters that I have been fortunate enough to meet. You know, I, I, you know, I, I do read a lot. I have a huge library at my house, and I, I'm an avid reader. As are my friends, mm-hmm. so I mean, uh, I got, uh, for instance, I just got turned on to uh, last year uh, a friend of a friend of this place here who lives close around named Paul Bear who mm-hmm. wrote a, a, a book called Jim Tully, where tomorrow actually I'm going to to do the uh, 
I'm going to play the uh, the, uh, uh, the opening of the film for the first time, and uh, and they're going to show the film, and then I'm going to do a set okay. of my own. I mean, so it's it, it's uh, it's about it's by this kind of thing that I get to meet those kind of people. That's what I'm trying to say. I got you. I mean, if it weren't for Jay and Tammy, I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't have, I, I would have never met Paul Bear. Mm -hmm. Nor would I have been given a book because he said, "How much your records?" And I said, "Well, how much is your book?" <laughs> <laughs> he said, "Well, my book is thirty-five dollars." I said, "Well, that'll be." Two records on your part, and I've given you a deal. <laughs> so, because uh, I sell my records for fifteen a piece. Anyway, I gave him the two records, and he sent me the book. Mm -hmm. But without being here, without being at this place, for instance, um, Scottsboro. Is it Scottsboro? Mm -hmm. What's the name of the town? St. Mary's. Where we're no, going here, to Streetsboro. Uh, Streetsboro. Oh. Yeah, Statesboro. Yes. I mean, if I hadn't been in Statesboro High, for instance, I love that. <laughs> I would have never been able to meet Paul Bear and and have him say, "Hey, how much your records?" I was like, and Jay told me about the book. I said, "How much is your book, man?" And tell me, I said, "Well, it'd be two records. I'm giving you a deal." So, with they met you on the same line. Pretty much true. Yeah. Pretty much. This is Tammy. This is Tammy talking. We, 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 we've met before, I think, right? Yeah. I believe so. I think so. Well, I'm just telling the audience. Yes. No, no. Well, she's the she's the only female here, so if you can't tell her, something's really wrong. She's the Tamsterina. There you go. By oh, God. Go. So, um, you, uh, you mentioned the Tully book. Uh-huh. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Because that ended up... Uh, Coming in on uh, Studio 10, yeah. your new album, right? I wrote two songs on Studio 10 about Tully. So uh, tell us a little bit about what that story is. About about Tully. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and, well, and your songs as well, you know. Well, he was a guy from St. Mary's, uh, Ohio. And, uh, and his parents were Irish immigrants. And very influenced by his grandfather, uh, Huey. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he was a rogue kid, uh, and back in those days, you're talking about back in the Depression era, in the 20s, uh, he was a rogue kid who rode the rails, and uh, he, he was given up by his family because he had six or seven other uh, siblings, and they couldn't take care of him. So he's given up to an orphanage in St. Mary's. Mm -hmm. So he grew up in St. Mary's, Ohio, there. And um, he took off. Uh, he sort of escaped from the uh, orphanage, I would say. And um, he rode the rails for a while, being a road kid. He came back to St. Mary's and then worked in the uh, chain factory there. Mm -hmm. uh, which I thought was, I thought was, Incredibly interesting that he would come back, and you know he was a short, stout fella um, who had sort of grown up on the rails, but came back and got a job in St. Mary's, the place that he'd skate. Mm -hmm. um, you see in the world, but you come back home, right? Right. Well, well, you, even if you don't like home necessarily. Right. Well, I, you know, I think you go back to where. You may go back where some of your blood is, whether it's a good idea or not, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? But whether it's a good idea or not, you may go back to where your blood is. And, and so he went back, and uh, the only job that was around at the time for somebody like him, uneducated uh, kid that had grown up on the rails, uh, was working in an, uh, a chain factory in St. Mary's. So, I found that part of it uh, very fascinating that he came back to the thing that had chased him away. Mm -hmm. You understand what I mean? Absolutely. I found that first part of it, and the way Paul and David have written this book, uh, they've done so much 
research. I, I think we spent like 12 years researching this. 20 years. Uh, 20. 20 years. 20 something years. Sorry. 20 something <laughs> years. Like, it's the just, internet. Swear as much as you want. Swear as much as you want. You've never even read one of my articles. You don't know how much I swear. <laughs> Jay's the one who knows how to use a computer, you know? I'm used to Tom. But anyway, <laughs> Jay told me, because, because of just me, me playing here at Jay's uh -huh. at the Honky Tonk, uh, which is now becoming famous all over the world. I mean, there are people from Europe that want to come over and play the Honky Tonk, you know? Because, As they should. Yeah. It's a great well, venue. and by God, they will, uh, unless I say no. Ah, oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. But you got to have a good programming director. No, 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 no. Sometimes Jay slacks. Come on, let's all face it, you know? Well, he... Mostly uh, he doesn't. I'm his wife, and I will attest to that. Well, it's how the hell I got here. Uh, yeah. No, Jay has some of the best uh, musical taste of anybody, He's and he just so left the room, so... Well, so does she. That's true. Tammy is great too. Now, mostly but Jay's passionate, and I'm just a student in his work. But I mean, I, but uh, it's how it happened. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's a um, cool part, isn't it? Sure, it's a real part of being a carny. You know, okay. like we all are. I mean, we, we all start out thinking that we want to be artists, and we end up. Realizing that really what we are is just a bunch of fucking carnies, aren't we? So it all becomes sort of like one thing meets another, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a, one interest becomes another interest, and, it, and and there is an evolution mm -hmm. to it. So I mean. I mean my being able to play here, Jay and Tammy's plays, mm -hmm. uh, was was my introduction to Paul Bear and um, and to Jim Tully. So when I read the book, I was absolutely uh, fascinated. Okay. So I read it the first time, then read it again, then read it again, and then uh, and I started writing about it, and then from that. Um, through Jay and Paul, I got in touch with uh, the filmmaker that was doing a documentary about Tully, mm -hmm. and he said, uh, "I'm just, I really love these songs that you've written about Tully. Would, would you mind writing the music for the film?" Mm -hmm. And I said, "Of course." Wade Stone is the is the is the guy. Okay. And uh, so tomorrow. Uh, uh, we're uh, we'll be doing the uh, very cool. The, uh, I'm going to do a show. Release and yeah, and I'm going to do a show after mm -hmm. the release of the film. So I mean, cool. and we're doing it, it. We're doing it in St. Mary's, Ohio, which is uh, also. Uh, you know, I mean, it's it's where it should be done, mm -hmm. really. Makes sense. Yeah, and I'm going to get to meet Emmett Lawler's. Uh, Grand nephew, I suppose. You know, Tully wrote a book called Emmett Lawler, and so I'm going to get to meet Gus Lawler tomorrow. Okay. So. So it's a whole big bunch of connections that all sure. started here. Well, because I've, and because of that, I've read most of Tully's books, the ones mm -hmm. that I can find. Um, I've read them. I've, I've, I guess I've read six or seven of them. Out of, I don't know, 12 or 13 year old. Mm -hmm. You can't find them all. But I, I, I think through Kent State University, I think now you'll, there will, will be a printing of all of these books. Yeah. Because of Paul and David. Um, well, that's cool. Isn't it? It, it is. is. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's so tough for, for the way the publishing industry is right now for you know anybody to sort of stick around in that world unless you're a bestseller, you know? And so a lot of people are like that, you know? Well, you they know, do great stuff. One time he was a bestseller. Right. You know, at one time, totally. But that was yesterday. Nobody that cares about yesterday in business. Ago. No, that's well, what I mean. But he like, fell you know. off the end of the fucking world, didn't he? I mean, he did. Uh, but at one time, he was selling more books than Hemingway and Fitzgerald put together. Mm. 
I mean, he was that popular writer for people because he was so there mm -hmm. for them. And uh, of course, Fitzgerald, being um, an Irishman, of course, wrote about a different area of being an Irishman in, in America. Tully wrote about being an Irishman in America and from a different, a completely different standpoint from being, uh, you know, a road kid or mm -hmm. a worker or steel worker or whatever, you know, or a whore. He, he wrote a great book about whores. I, I have no idea how he might have done that. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's one of those things where you just got to do research, I suppose, you know? Well, I think you probably researched Pro Probably a little bit. bit. Yeah, yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Yes. Tammy should go to bed now. I think the old that's Tully the Chaplin, yes. Charlie School. Chaplin. No, no. no. I, I like the whole Tully, Charlie Chaplin connection, too. Uh, well, that's that, pretty interesting. Yeah. That whole. You know, he worked for Chaplin, too, Tully. I did not actually. He is a very cool He wrote for it. Oh, yeah? He wrote for it. And also, he wrote for W.C. Fields. Okay. So, I mean, Even more so. Um, but when he's. Uh, he's fallen out with Chaplin, I think. Uh, he worked with Chaplin for eight or nine years, I think, if I remember correctly. And I'm sure I do. <laughs> um, he had a fallen out which happened shortly after the uh, Hearst murder on the out on the ship on the boat, mm -hmm. and um, he had a fallen out with him. And when you have a fallen out with somebody like Charlie Chaplin in Hollywood, I mean, like I say in the song, you know, it's a big fucking deal. Yeah, Hollywood's just a place to hang your soul, man. Right. You know. But anyway, he. he Kind of like Nashville, but we'll not get into that. Yeah, well, yeah. It's, it's, it's a hard, it, that's a hard run. But what happened to Tully was that when he sort of fell off the end of the world as a, as a, um, um, a novelist, then he started becoming um, a critic in Hollywood and was the first man, the uh, first person, uh, besides, then later came Dorothy Parker. Mm -hmm. uh, to be called the most dangerous person in Hollywood <laughs> because he became a critic. Mm -hmm. And um, he had written for some of the best. I mean, he'd written for Chaplin, he'd written for Fields, uh, he'd written for so many different people. I mean, going all the way back to silent movies he had written. So then he became, I mean, when he got fired by Chaplin, then he became a critic. Right. So it's interesting, he kind of got. So the nailed by the establishment and then became the guy you don't want to tick off. So. He got absolutely nailed by the establishment. I'm learning just sitting here talking. Well, all of you musicians out there who may be listening to that, that's why you should treat me nice. Because, you know, if you don't, I will write a bad review. And everybody knows you can't sell a record in this country if Diesel gives you a bad review. Um, but... Uh, I guess sort of an offshoot of that whole story is because we were talking about um, Jay and Tammy introducing yeah. you to all of them. Um, sort of on the reverse side of that, Jay and Tammy introduced me to you. Yeah. Um, I probably wouldn't have heard about you had they uh, had they not done that. Well, and, bless their hearts. Yeah. I mean, that's a good deal. Well, right? see, that's that's one of the great things about what they do. And I mean, I tend to think I'm pretty knowledgeable about music compared to most people, at least I try to be. Yeah. But the people that these guys know, you know, are people who, unless you have a connection, you probably are never going to find out about them. No, well, I, you know, I, 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 you know I, I, I don't know that that's completely true. Mm -hmm. I, know it's, I know it's true in many ways. I know that Jay and Tammy have introduced me to a lot of people that have helped me. But... It's, it was just another place to play for me when I first came here. Mm -hmm. And when I got here, what I did was I, I found people who loved me and appreciated me and who knew probably more about my music than I did, mm -hmm. really. Almost like Europeans, Jay and Tammy. Uh, it's, uh, they'll, they'll say, oh, no, I think you did that in 1987 or whatever. But you see what I mean? I mean, you, you, you've got people who uh, 
in my in, in my opinion, it's the thing that keeps the industry going. Really. I mean, otherwise you're going to end up with people like you know, Bieber and what, what's his name? Is it Bieber? Uh, Justin Bieber, the bane of all musical existence. Well, yes. I don't think you. You know, I mean, you know, fucking hell. There's been people who's probably been worse. This is true. Um, but he's just sort of on top of the well, band he, now. He, yeah. He's the name now that yeah. everybody wants to call. Us. Well, I mean, it's it's you know, the big Swift, music, Swift right. and that kind of deal. I mean, you big know, music has become I, we're, lowest common I'm an denominator. Old guy. I'm yeah. an older guy. I mean, mm-hmm. people like me and Shaver are all we're we're old fuckers, really. I mean, um, and we've been doing this quite a long time. You know, I mean. Guy Charles Clark is 71 years old now, mm-hmm. and um, uh, I'm 60, I'll be 64 my next birthday, and for me to be able to play as many shows a year as I'm playing is uh, commendable. Well, yeah, yeah, and it, it, it's, uh, well, it's, it, it makes me a lucky boy, actually, mm-hmm. really, because I mean, I continue to. Dude, I mean, I meet us. friends through Jay and Tammy that uh, have other shows. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I was thinking. Love it's... me, and, 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 you know, standing ovations and uh, all that kind of. or ovulations, actually. One of the two. <laughs> One of the two. Um, but I was just going to say, I think it's really interesting to me. Um, because a lot of the folks that I talk to in the music industry are either just starting out or they're people like you who've been around for a long time. Uh And it amazes me that no musician who is in your position ever wants to quit. You know, no musician wants to stop making music. And any other job in the world, you know, you want to be retired from it. Uh, I know Jay... Uh, who is an accountant is looking forward to the day when he doesn't have to be an accountant anymore. Well, he'll, he'll, he'll just be, a, he'll do this. Yeah, well, exactly. But you get to do it all on your own. So, you know, you can you can keep playing as a musician and you never want to quit, well, right? Well, you know, I think it's a very interesting thing about how it's looked at these days, isn't it? I mean, uh, I mean, B.B. Uh, King is still playing and everybody's still going to see him and, mm-hmm. and nobody is asking him to retire. Nobody's asking him he's going to retire. Um, you know, I played with Lightning Hopkins right up until the very end mm-hmm. and I don't think Lightning would have ever thought of retiring nor would Man, Man Slipscomb or Fred McDowell, who I also played with. Uh, so. For what I do, no, I, I don't look at retirement. I, you know, I'll probably die doing what I do, you know. I mean, it's it's just one of those things. What else am I going to do, really? I mean... Well, you uh, could go fishing a lot. I mean, well, it's true. I could go fishing a lot. And when I can fish, I do fish. <laughs> you just don't want to do that 200 days a year. You'd rather no, be playing, I, huh? I'd much rather be riding and playing. I mean, I'm glad that I'm still writing at my age mm-hmm. because there's a lot of people who don't write singular songs at their age. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a lot of people at my age that are writing, for instance, like God Charles Clark, for instance, who I, 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 I have an enormous love for and uh, uh, no distance between us at all, but I mean, Guy's doing a lot of co-writing now with two, mm-hmm. two, three, or four other people at a time. I couldn't do that. I just couldn't. Um, I think for me to be my age and, and writing singular songs as I'm doing, I think is a, I think that's important to me. Okay. And I think when I can't do that, I think then maybe I would. I would do that. I'd start robbing banks or, oh, come on. or gas stations or something oh, like that. Yeah. Oh, come on, Tim. You know Well, I would. you don't have to co write, but well, you don't you gotta rob banks. No, but you know I'd. But it might be fun. Come on, let's no. face it. No. You know, robbing, no, oh, come on. Robbing gas stations could be fun. They're kind easy. A, come on. We're getting off track. Yeah. It's all good. It's kind of a volume it's, it's, plot thing here. Speaking of co writing. Phil Lee made one of the best comments I ever heard when somebody asked him about living in Nashville and, and, and 
having friends like Peter Cooper and Eric Brace and right, yeah. Tommy Womack and all these other great right, songwriters yeah. and if you ever get into co-writing and Phil said, I don't need any help. <laughs> I don't Simplicity either. Simplicity <laughs> don't need greased. I think that's a Billy Joe Shane return, is it? Yeah. yeah, it is now. That's for sure. No, I don't no, think I need any greased. I mean, I mean, the two song right, the, the two co-writes I wrote have been completely accidental. Mm -hmm. and, um, well, um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to step on you there, but um, in, in that case, um, let's talk about a couple of the things that you've been writing lately. Um, we talked a little bit about the two Tully songs on Studio Ten. Yeah. Um, but uh, we started out about talking about how Jay and Tammy introduced me to you, and uh, I actually first got to listen to Studio Ten yesterday because I tramped over here and borrowed Jay's copy. So I'm not um, the biggest expert on it yet, but uh, I'm sure Jay has has gone through it. So um, could you suggest a song that you particularly found interesting, and maybe we can uh, have you talk about that, Eric? No, I guess, you know, without a doubt, uh, the song Bill, because of the, uh, you know, I'm big on the emotional connection, uh, and I kind of know some of the backstory. I know, I didn't know Bill, but I, uh, you know, know uh, the people where he played his last show, and, uh, uh, and I know Bill from his music, and then to hear what Eric's done in terms of writing a song, it's, uh, it's a pretty amazing piece of work to me. And um, for people who don't know, because they haven't heard the record yet, uh, which Bill are we talking about? Bill here? Morrissey. Bill Morrissey. Okay. And so, what? Uh, what was the reason you chose to write that write that song about him? Uh, because he was a, a friend, a very close friend of mine, and uh, I'm not. Uh, I've never written. Things from a cathartic, uh, any cathartic reasons, mm -hmm. but I mean the song about Bill. Um, shortly after Bill died, uh, and him being my friend and, and quite close, um, the song came and uh, it was written. Very rarely would I ever do something like that. I don't write catharsis type tunes. Mm -hmm. Mostly, I write character songs. You know, I mean, like I say, I mean, I'm a, you know, I'm a guy that writes about characters. I, I don't write a lot of songs about me. I write songs about other people. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know who I am. I don't find myself that interesting, really. <laughs> but I find other people very interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would, for instance, if we were talking about the Tully thing, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, when given something of that nature, I'll take it and run with it. Really. Okay. But Bill, uh, from the standpoint of what Jay is saying, uh, it was a song that, uh, one of the few, very few songs that I th have ever written that I thought had to be written and the way it was written. It's very, it's very simple and um, it's very about Bill. So, I mean, I was able to write a song about a, a, a man that I love very much and a, and a friend that I, I loved uh, very much that I was able to leave myself out of most of it. <laughs> but I, I put enough of myself in it to have it be a song. Okay. Well, I mean, that everything comes from your own perspective. And, you know, there's a, um, the idea, I guess, sometimes, you know, when you're, you're looking at something, that inherently changes it. Yeah. Um, and obviously, if you're going to then take that and translate it into a song, it's all got to be from what you know in your perspective. Well, so there's no the, real way. Know, there's also a song in here called Francis Town, which it, mm -hmm. which I wrote in a barrel house kind of sound as a tribute to my old friend Dave Van Monk. Oh, okay. Out of New York. But, I mean, Dave's been dead now 10 or 12 years, I mm -hmm. suppose. But I'd never been able to write a song about him. 
um, that I wanted, that or that I ended up liking. So what I did was write a song like he would write. No, oh, okay. So Francis Town is basically a tribute to Ben Rock. Oh. Uh, String of Pearls at the end of the record is a is a tribute to one of my close friends of Holland. So he died. I uh, got to go see back what before you right back before he died. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess it seems like a lot of the people who made it onto this album in one way or another um, directly influenced you or were, were people that you, you knew. I mean, obviously, the Tully story is something that was historical yeah. and all that. Um, and obviously, like you said, you know, one of the things that you do as a musician is go around the country and meet people and then, you know, sort of adapt their stories sometimes. Into, oh, but I into also wanted right? to write on this record. Uh, if you listen to the record uh, all the way through, uh, there's three or four songs on there about strong women. Mm -hmm. And I, it started out with a conversation I had with a woman, uh, a writer, a friend of mine from uh, Seattle, Washington, and I said, you know, I wonder what it would be like for me to write a, a, a record, uh, write a whole record on, from the perspective of women. And she says, well, I think it would be difficult. <laughs> and she was right. But I was able to get three or four songs out of it, like Molly's Painted Pony mm -hmm. is about a woman who, who uh, took no shit and no numbers from anyone. She took care of it. There's also a, there's also a song in there about a woman uh, that, that's called Audios. It's about a woman who's saying, you know, she's had enough, mm -hmm. and you know, she's she's taking her shit and she's leaving, and, and she's saying adios. Uh, and there's another song on there that goes the same direction. So I mean, when I when I put it together, I mean, I really was. I mean, I had written these songs about. I was starting to write this little dialogue actually about uh, the strength of women and how important it is. Uh, and I don't know very many men who write about it from that perspective. I don't, I don't know very many men who write from a female perspective. And the, to me, as a writer, I, I saw that as uh, a, a challenge that mm -hmm. I wanted to me, you know. Well, I totally understand because actually, um, I mean, a lot of times when I'm writing, you know, I like to have a female main character. It, in some ways, just to make it farther away from me, so I can think about, you know, what it would be like to be in that situation versus, you know, writing about something that I necessarily know about. I, I kind of like taking those challenges on too, yeah. so I can totally see that. Well, you know, I think a lot of it came from my conversations with, with uh, my friend in Seattle, which I'll, I'll have a remain nameless. Uh, okay. Uh, but there aren't that many people in Seattle. I'm sure we can guess who it is. Well, it's also because I've been married four times. Yeah, okay. Damn. You know, I mean, I haven't, beat up, been, I haven't been very successful at being able to understand the challenges that women have had with me. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, uh, I've been very truthful with you. I mean, there, uh, there's so many things that I think I probably did uh, not physically abusive necessarily, but maybe physically abusive from the standpoint of being um, uh, emotionally abusive. So I think there were, I think there's an interest that I have in that and, 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 and the strength that I've seen in women. And I, I wish that there were more men who wrote about the strength that they see in women, mm -hmm. uh, especially based on their falls, you know, with the men's falls. Right. I could hang out here all day and night. Well, it's your place. Get so in, you can, in, girl. Get in.
gonna hug my man because he treats me right. That sounds like a plan. <laughs> you see what I mean? So, um, so a song that you uh, you mentioned in there uh, was the the lead off track. Uh, which is Molly's Painted Pony. Molly's Painted Pony, yeah. And uh, I want to uh, just sort of give people an idea of some of the, the interesting points on that song because mm-hmm. I think in a lot of ways it's it's a kind of a good encapsulation of what you do um, because it's a song that goes through a number of different stylistic elements. Sure. And it, it seems to me a lot of your songs, okay. what you're doing musically reflects the picture of... of, of the mood that you're trying to set, like, or, uh, or, it's a piece of, uh, it's, it's a piece of writing that I put the music. Actually. Right, right. So I mean, with Molly, for instance, um, you know, I mean, it's one of it's one of America's life stories, really. I mean, you know, she finds her sister with her husband. And she goes down the street, and she gets a gun from the gunsmith, and she shoots them both, and then she ends up dying. And so, it is a, a, a part of uh, primitive Americana, mm-hmm. I think, uh, that has not left itself to be primitive. I mean. You know what I mean? Well, it depends on if you think we're still primitive or not. Well, you know, I think it's it's a story that can still happen today. Right. It may not happen on a horse. It may happen in it may happen with a Honda. But you know, uh, I think the way I wanted to ride it was uh, that she was taking care of business. Okay. I got you. Know what I mean? Well, I, um, like I said, I find it interesting because, uh, you know, in, in contrast to what some other people do, um, I think it goes back to that Faulkner thing in some ways that uh, we were talking about before, but you actually mentioned in one of your songs, uh, you obliquely reference, well, maybe not that obliquely, but uh, On the Road. Mm-hmm. Um, and in some ways, I feel like that's more... Um, about what you're doing than anything else. It's that sure. sort of stream I was of consciousness. Very influenced by those guys. Okay. Uh, the early Kerouac stuff. I was very interested. Uh, on the road, of course, certainly played a great part in my life because of how old I am and when I read it. You know, I first read it when I was 12 years old, and I've read it ever since. Every two years, I suppose. It's a good one to reread for sure. Um, Okay. But, you know, most people don't realize about that book was it was not written about one trip. It was written about four different mm-hmm. trips from uh, New York to San Francisco with he and Neil Cassidy. It wasn't about one trip. Um, it was written in 1949. It wasn't published until September of 1957. Mm-hmm. So, um, by that time, Jack had changed quite a bit, and and I I, I was never able to, I, I was never able to meet Jack. I, I, I've been able to meet Corso, and I've been able to meet uh, Ginsburg was a friend of mine. Very cool. But um, Jack had pretty much lost himself long before that. Mm-hmm. So. Um, Jack wrote this piece about freedom following, in 1949 following the war, actually. Mm-hmm. And everybody thinks it was written in 1957, but well, it wasn't It wasn't published until 1957. Mm-hmm. So I, I find that to be, when I do the song about Dean Moriarty, Don't Live Here No More, mm-hmm. it's what I mean. I mean, I, I mean, that's where I got the line. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm sad about the way it, 
the way that Jack died and what people think of him and, and that kind of deal. And, and Neil as well, Neil Cassidy as mm -hmm. well. I mean, I got to meet Cassidy's wife, Carolyn. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, got to meet her. I got to meet Jack's. Uh, I got to meet Jack's uh, daughter, Jan, who's written a, who wrote a couple of novels before she drank herself to death as mm -hmm. well. Um, I mean, she did um, exactly the same thing that her father did. She, uh, I mean, uh, uh, there were people like me and Ginsburg and, and uh, others that did everything we could do to, to try to help her, but uh, she wouldn't accept it. Right. Well, a lot of people are like that. And well, of course. A lot of artists especially, it seems to be, you know, some of what you were saying earlier, it's just part of the life, and, you know, you were lucky, I think. Obviously, well, I became a colony. Oh, there you go. Uh, and, uh, I mean, but I, those were people who were very. I mean, Kerouac's on the road was a very. I read it when first when I was twelve years old, like I said, mm -hmm. and it was an incredible influence on me. But um, so many others were as well. Corso and Burroughs. Right. And, uh, well, you, you can really tell as a listener. Um, at least I certainly could. Um, when I was listening to you live tonight, uh, more so than on the studio albums, mm -hmm. um, but you can tell that you're steeped in that sort of world because honestly, I think the closest description to what you do on stage is you're basically a beat poet and you got the guitar mm -hmm. and you're doing your entire thing and then you're playing some notes behind it to, sure. to accentuate it. Um, would you say that's fair? I would say that that's very fair. Okay. I would, and I would, I would say that I thank you for it. I, 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 I think I'm an actor as mm -hmm. well. That's what I think. And I write plays as well as songs. So I, I have an interest in acting. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of what I do on stage is acting. I would say absolutely. A lot of people think that, that you know, this shit comes right off the top of my head. It's not. It's written. It's uh, most of it's written. Jay, uh, Jay's heard me enough to know that uh, these are written pieces, and uh, and I think they're I think they're as important part of the song than the song itself. Right. Uh, well, you de you definitely do it in an extemporaneous manner, so well, I can I understand why people would think that. But. Sure. I, well, I think there's some people that can pull it off, and there's people that can't. Mm -hmm. so. You know, I think you can. I think most people really uh, that come to listen to what I do can tell the difference between a phony and somebody who's not. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that's all I'm interested in. You know, is I don't want anybody to leave thinking I was a, a phony. Yeah. I think there's a small chance of that probably yeah, thinking yeah. of one of your shows for sure. Well, Jay, before this you run, yours. I love uh, you. I'll be here in a moment. I won't be, but it's all good. Uh, before you run, you maybe you have been. Um, that's true. <laughs> uh, you actually told me that I had to ask uh, Mr. Taylor a specific question. I did. Um, and since you're here, you're about to go to bed, and we want to wrap this up. Go ahead and ask him so that all of our listeners can hear the story. Well, when we were over at uh, Harmony. Had Harmony in the uh, house at the Bottle Brush Gallery and yep. told a story about Sterling Hayden. Mm -hmm. And I guess I had seen movies that Sterling was in, but yeah. I didn't know who he was. And uh, he introduced me to a friend of yours, uh, and I'm glad I met him, although he died in 1986. Yeah. And uh, I just think uh, that's worth retelling. Because it was it's, just uh, a very, very dear friend. And, um, yeah, I met him. I met him when I was going up to uh, meet this very suspicious uh, record producer in Sausalito, and um, I was driving the 1963 Volkswagen. And was, I think it's the story he was talking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, I heard a pop, and uh, go anymore. And then the next thing I know. I'll see you in the morning. Are you going to be around? Yeah. Thanks, Jay. Catch you later. 
I met him. There was a guy pulled up behind me in a, um, uh, an old beat up uh, um, common gear car. And he got off the car. He got off the car with a, a, a glass of whiskey or a glass of rum, actually, in this hand, and two cigarettes in this hand. And he says, "What's wrong with your right, boy?" And I said, "I think it's the clutch." Anyway, he ended up fixing my clutch cable with a uh, with some shark line that he had, because he was a sailor. Okay. Certainly, Hayden was an actor, but he only acted because he wanted to sail. <laughs> well, you need money to do that, right? So, well, I, you know, there, uh, there's a book that I would suggest that everybody read by Hayden, uh, a book called Voyager. Uh, it's a, uh, the name of it is Bo. Okay. And then there's another book. Um, they wrote it's a fictional piece of uh, this. It was supposed to be written in the. It was written during the period of the 1800s called Voyager, or the Voyage. No, the Voyage. The Voyage. That was the name of it. Now, the Voyager was the name of his boat. Okay. He never let anyone call it a yacht, but uh, he didn't like it. But he was a great actor. And, uh, he was the actor that was the uh, chief of police that broke Michael Corleone's nose, mm -hmm. Godfather. Mm -hmm. the first and Godfather. Uh, also in uh, one of my other favorite movies, which was the uh, Stanley Kubrick classic, yes. Dr. Strangelove. And he was, he was awesome he, in that. He was the colonel. Yep. An unforgettable role, too. I mean, and one of the only roles that wasn't played by, um, ooh, no, I can't remember his name. Who's the star of that film? Um, you know, one of the most famous actors in history. Uh, it's not coming I don't to remember. Me. I don't Peter remember. Sellers, no. of course. No. Uh, it was one of the only roles in the entire movie that Peter Sellers didn't play, it seems. And he was just amazing in it. Yeah, he was, uh, Sterling was an incredible friend. And he was, uh, you know, I'm so lucky to have been able to meet someone like him because, I mean, he was a guy that had a set of balls that uh, you could bounce against anything without bitting them, you know what I mean? He was one of those guys, and and he was real. He, 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 none of it was uh, forsaken mm -hmm. in any way. He was very real. And, uh, well, you kind of have to be to, to meet a guy in the streets and jump under his car and put it together with some fishing line. I mean, shark line. Yeah, exactly. You got to know what you're doing, right? It's not, it's not an affectation at that point. Well, the great thing about it is the story. The great thing about the story was I realized it was. Mm -hmm. And I, finally I said, uh, when he was crawling up underneath my carpet, with, with my boatswain and band went this 250-pound uh, shark line. Uh, to repair my clutch cable, I said, Mr. I said, Mr. Hayden, is there, any, is there any way I can help you? And he says, no, boy. You wouldn't know how to tie the knot. <laughs> In other words, it was a fishing knot. Right. It was And uh, he drove only Volkswagens. He drove old Volkswagens and old Carmen Gears, yeah. So, uh, I mean, he had three or four or five of them, actually, in his place. But he also had, a, a, behind his house, he had, a, a, he had laid some um, rail line, and he put a caboose back there. And that's where he lived while he was building his house inside. Okay. So when I stayed with him, I stayed in the caboose. It was the, then the guest house. Oh, that's cool. Which had a little cook stove in it. And it was just brilliant. I mean, I mean, you, you could spend days out there and not see him, mm -hmm. really, you know. But he was in, he was quite the incredible character. I mean, you can look up inter, you can look up Sterling Hayden and and, uh, and see interviews that he did, but. People like um, 
uh, Dick Cavett or Tom Snyder. Uh, you're probably too young to know who Tom Snyder is. Uh, I'm vaguely aware. I've never seen his show, obviously. But I mean, all the you can look up Hayden, Sonny Hayden, you, and you can see all the in, different interviews, and you can see what a character he was. Just three days ago, I had a it goes through. It went down here, just like Hayden's did. Oh yeah. And, yeah. Then my goatee became more famous than me. I hate when that happens. So I cut it off. I'll grow back. Yeah. Well, see, that's one of the nice things about beards. You know, I change them all the time, too. You can do whatever you want, right? Yes. Um, so I guess just uh, to, to close things off, um, I want to remind everybody um, that your new album is called Studio 10. Oh, yeah. Uh, and it came out in June, correct? Yes. Um, and... You, what would you like people to know about it? What's what's the driving thing behind it that, that you think music lovers um, need to know uh, before they decide? Well, it's the first it's the first real studio album I've done in seven years. I mean, I've done live Red Shot in mm -hmm. between that, which is really, I mean, it's a studio album, but it's live. You know. This is the first uh, one that I've uh, after the heart, after the heart uh, surgery, I had a triple bypass, and uh, uh, although I've never suffered from uh, writer's block, I think there was a time where I really slowed down. And, uh, this record was um, I wanted it to be quite immediate. So when I finished the song, I went right to Stu and cut it. Okay. As opposed to how I'd done before, where I would save up you know, 15 songs and go in there and do 12 of them and see which ones were. So how long, if it just wasn't one session, how long of a time period was it Year between? And a half, okay. Well, that's, uh, that's a lot of times going into the studio to, to finish things up. That's pretty cool. I've, Never yeah. really heard of anybody recording that way before in you know a well, serious. I'd, I'd, I'd never recorded that way before. I I'd always thought that I needed to have my shit together before I went in, you mm -hmm. know? and uh, I wanted these songs to be really uh, on the bone, you know. Well, okay. Um, so can you just uh, let everybody know then? Um, where Studio 10 is available and what your website it's is? On, it's on uh, bluerubymusic.com. Um, we've decided not to have any downloads on, on it. Uh, you can hear pieces of it, but it's on bluerubymusic.com. Um, you can buy it there. Um, but, uh, you know, I've decided not to do any uh, more of the uh, uh, digital downloads. No, I've decided not to do it. No. Uh, I've kind of figured out I'm an old school guy and I'm, I've, I've been, you know, they're really screwing me on the money. Mm. I'm really getting screwed on the money. So I'm just not doing that anymore. If you want the record, buy it. If you don't want it, then don't. There you go. It. Well, uh, like you said, it's available on, on your site, so everybody should Blue get on Ruby over there. BlueRubyMusic.com. BlueRubyMusic.com. The album is Studio 10. The gentleman who wrote and uh, sang and played on all the songs is Eric Taylor. And uh, I want to thank you once again uh, uh, for joining you, us. Man. Thank you, man. Thank you. I really, uh, really enjoyed talking to you. Great, great. Well, I definitely had a lot of fun, and those are some great stories, so hopefully everybody listening at home enjoyed it, too. Um, and once again, like you said, we should thank our hosts, uh, Jay and Tammy, at the Honky Tonk House concerts, um, not only for having Mr. Taylor here to play for us, but allowing us to stay in their home and, uh, and do this interview. Yeah, so it's always absolutely. great stuff. Great. Right. And uh, this has been, once again, another edition of No Surf Music's Burning River Fireside Chats. Eric, thanks again. Thank you, man. And everybody out there, we'll see you next time. This is Jason D. Diesel Hammond, your host, signing off. This has been a No Surf Music Burning River Fireside Chat. This is your host, Jason D. Diesel Hammond, signing off.
Remember, No Surf Music is your source for the best in Americana, alt country, indie rock, and more. For original reviews and interviews, visit nosurfmusic.com.